right. It has occurred to me that if your building's in REAP, which stands for Rent Escrow Adjustment Program, that you have been to the general manager's meeting and your building has been violating certain things that have been brought upon the owner as notice. Notice that they are violating the rights of the tenant by not keeping habitability. So they get stuck with this problem. The money in REAP, the rent adjustment program, is sent in by the tenant at a percentage of what their rent would normally be. If your rent's a uh, $400, all of a sudden it's $100 at the most. Uh, in our case, at least, we're 95% violation uh, ratio. That's what it breaks down to for the number of violations. They got over 22, and therefore we have a $50 to $100 rent maximum with a 3% raise per year at the most. So, um, where am I going with this? REAP. If your building's in REAP, the, the landlord can only collect a very, very small percentage. And that money first goes to the city through the city's program called REAP, through the HCDILA, Housing Commission Investment Development um, Department. And um, they take that money in the mail at this special address, certified check or money order, blah, blah, blah. And it's a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of what the money was. And that goes to paying the supplies for doing the repairs on the building. So our building has been in REAP since what year, Jackalope? 2017. No, Eight. before that. 2004 or five. Oh, okay. Or six. Yeah, that's right. Way before Reuben, Reuben Pina. Yeah, yeah. It was like under Fred Medell. Yeah. So our building's been in REAP under its owner. <laughs> and then it's his son-in-law or nephew or whatever, a family member, years later is in second REAP. Now, you can't be in two REAPs. So they discontinue the second REAP, but they continue the first REAP, meaning they never stopped the REAP. The REAP has been, it has always been, and it will always be until these problems have been faced. Now, they also declared this place habitable, but some Snyder guy, Steve Snyder, he's a scam artist. He comes in and tries to get the place on the uh, vacated list by saying it's unhabitable. So an inspector comes out and says, ah, you're a liar place is habitable but it has violations up the wazoo all right so we're at that point so now a shitload of other people try to buy this place and the lender of certain instances many times over has sold the place repeatedly knowing all of this fair and well so you're asking yourself what am i saying well what am i saying is that if you can only collect a hundred dollars a month on a place that you as a lender try to say is worth a hundred dollars a day $3,000 value, supposedly, that you're losing $2,900 on, then you can't meet rent assignments for your loan that you've lended. That means the person borrowing money from you could never actually meet the demands of the loan and then would for sure be foreclosed upon. You would never assign them the loan. You'd never give them the money. Your title company would never insure you. None of these things would actually be real. Nobody in their right fucking mind would actually give money out like this unless they had a scam in mind. Unless they were going to lose money for title insurance scams. If they were going to take money on hard money lending that was specifically take, take, take and screw everybody over. If they were a real property fraudster. If they were a bank fraudster. If they call those banksters. If they were anybody at all, the broker wanting to collect money on his, on his commission, wanting to take the extra on asking for more money than was necessary for construction loans from the construction company that's actually just trying to bind it up in, in, uh, in encumbrances for liens on the property that are unnecessary for improvements that only assess the value of the property to be more, which is all of what happens. So this place has got over 22 major violations. Nothing has been done to it in any shape or form to actually correct any of them, except for by myself and my partner. And there's been 200 plus thousand dollars consistently added to it every transfer. And it's been sold like four times since I've been here illegally while we're the only possessors. So it occurred to me that if you're in REAP, everybody's full of shit because they know and their disclosure between each other, themselves, the property, is one Google search away from finding out that they're in REAP, and they know it. 
and that it's already there. They're just not disclosing it because they all want to scam the property. They're all mortgage frauders. And it's definitive proof at this point. We're in REAP. We have been. Google it. 1968 Avon, 1410 Ewing. Look it up. R-E-A-P. H-C-D-I-L-A. That's all you need to know. Search those two things. You'll see. You're totally full of shit if you're trying to move forward on taking our property. We're going to take you. We're going to take you right to the FBI. the challenges and systemic issues surrounding global corruption, governance, and their far-reaching impacts. At the gap between the expansive, often unchecked power of global economic forces and the limited capacity of traditional governments and international institutions to effectively regulate and govern these entities. This imbalance or asymmetry results in what is described as failing governance, manifesting in various detrimental forms such as corruption, environmental degradation, exploitation, and ineffective responses to climate change. Entrenched corruption not only undermines development efforts but also perpetuates poverty, conflict, and inequality, with grand corruption being a significant contributor to global issues affecting billions of people. The realization that the fight against corruption cannot be won in isolation. Even powerful nations and their major corporations participated in corrupt practices, viewing them as a standard operating procedure in international business. This systemic problem is further exacerbated by legal and regulatory frameworks which often did not criminalize foreign bribery, creating a prisoner's dilemma where no single entity could afford to unilaterally cease corrupt practices without risking competitive disadvantage. Through collective action and the development of a new norm and regulatory protocol like OECD Anti-Bribery Convention, which marked a significant step towards global efforts to address corruption. This achievement, however, required the mobilization of civil society, the cooperation of the private sector, and the commitment of governments to enact and enforce new laws that redefine the boundaries of acceptable behavior in international business. The essential role of civil society in bridging the gap between economic forces and governance structures. By advocating for transparency, accountability, and ethical conduct, civil society organizations can catalyze change, even in the face of entrenched interests and systemic inertia. This collaborative approach, involving governments, businesses, and civil society, is a model for addressing not only corruption, but other areas of failing governance globally. Relating the narrative about global corruption and the systemic failure of governance to the specific issue of local departments, like the Los Angeles Department of Building and Safety, LADBS, taking payments for fines after the fact to post building permits, we can observe a microcosm of the broader challenges discussed. The act of accepting payments to legitimize actions that have already occurred without proper initial authorization mirrors the systemic corruption described on a global scale, albeit on a local or municipal level. The situation with LADBS exemplifies how systemic issues of governance can permeate local institutions, undermining trust and efficiency. Just as global economic players often operate with impunity due to inadequate governance structures, local entities might also engage in practices that prioritize financial transactions over regulatory compliance and ethical standards. Accepting payments for fines after unauthorized construction has occurred reflects a failure in governance similar to what's described in the global context. It indicates a loophole in the regulatory framework that allows for retroactive legitimization of actions that bypass established rules and procedures. This practice not only compromises the integrity of the building and safety regulations, but also raises questions about accountability and fairness, echoing the concerns of failing governance on a larger scale. The consequences of such practices at the local level include potential safety risks, unequal treatment of citizens, and erosion of trust in public institutions. 
These outcomes parallel the broader implications of corruption and failing governance globally, where the lack of effective oversight and accountability leads to environmental degradation, social inequality, and diminished faith in political and economic systems. Addressing these challenges requires reform and collective action, similar to the global fight against corruption. Stakeholders at the local level, residents, community organizations, and ethical officials must work together to demand transparency, accountability, and adherence to regulations. This may involve advocating for changes in policies, increased public oversight of municipal processes, and the establishment of clear, enforceable consequences for non-compliance. Just as civil society plays a crucial role in combating global corruption, local community groups and concerned citizens are vital in advocating for better governance practices within municipal departments like LADBS. By raising awareness, mobilizing community action, and engaging in dialogue with local authorities, civil society can help ensure that local governance structures serve the public's best interests and operate within the framework of the law and ethical standards. The systemic issues of corruption and failing governance, whether on a global scale or within local institutions like LADBS, share common roots in the asymmetry between economic actions and regulatory oversight. Addressing these issues requires a concerted effort from all sectors of society to restore integrity, accountability, and the primacy of ethical governance in managing both global economic forces and local administrative processes.